Hi, welcome back to the Grammar Park channel. This is Sharon Nisha. In this session, we are going to see the summary of Prologue to the Canterbury Tales written by Geoffrey Chaucer. And this is the part one and this summary will be helpful for preparing PGTRB net slide examinations. Let's see about life of Geoffrey Chaucer. Geoffrey Chaucer was born in 1340 and he lived up to 1400. He was born in London. He was the son of John Chaucer. John Chaucer was a vintner of Thames Street who had also a small estate at Ipswich and was occasionally employed on service for the King Edward III. Chaucer seems to have received ample education, but there is no evidence that he had been at either of the great universities. In 1357, he appeared as a page to Lady Elizabeth, wife of Lionel, Duke of Clarence. In 1359, he first saw military service in France during that time, he was made as a prisoner and later he was ransomed in 1360. In 1369, in honor of the death of Blanche, she is the wife of John of Gaunt, wrote poetry called The Death of Blanche, the Duchess. In 1373, he began to write Canterbury Tales. And he was called as the morning star of poetry, the father of English literature, the father of English poetry, the father of English language, the morning star of Renaissance, the first national poet. The age of Chaucer roughly covers the whole of the 14th century. Chaucer's deep insight, acute understanding and sympathetic outlook enabled him to represent the very spirit of the age. He stood serene amidst the tumult and fury of social contrasts and political changes. He remained detached and weak at a dispassionate account of the men and manners of his age from this morning star of English poetry. The age of Chaucer was remarkable for many significant political, religious, social and literary activities. Origin of the prologue. The prologue is so interesting because it suggests the framework of the Canterbury Tales and paints a picture of national life. It is believed that Boccaccio's Decameron was an example to, Cha to Chaucer to write the Canterbury Tales. But Chaucer goes beyond his model and gives his new significance to his work by his insight and perception by his genial humor and humanism. Here, in this prologue, the poet represents himself as alighting one spring evening at the Tabard Inn in Southwark a suburb at the southern end of London Bridge, where later the famous Elizabethan playhouses, Shakespeare's among them, were to spring up. Southwark was the place of departure and arrival for all South England travel and especially for pilgrimages to the shrine of St. Thomas a Becket at Canterbury. Tabard Inn was caught fire in 1669 and the fire destroyed the Tabard Inn and it was rebuilt and also renamed as Tabold Inn. It survived for next 150 years and after that the arrival of railways in 1800 and also the declining of passing trade which demolished in 1873. There were so many inns and among them George Inn is the only survivor from 1500 and which is also present now and all the remaining inns were demolished. The picture below you see is taken before the demolishment of uh, Tabalt Inn. Before going to see the text, we should know who is Thomas Beckett and for what he is famous and what are the magical powers he had, why the people liked to go to the pilgrimage to the shrine of Thomas Beckett. Thomas Beckett was also known as Saint Thomas of Canterbury, Thomas of London, and later Thomas a Bucket he was called. He was born in 21st December 1119 or 1120 and he lived up to 29th December 1170. In that particular day he was murdered and he was the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1162 until his murder in 1170. He is venerated as a saint and martyr by both the Catholic Church and the Anglican Communion. King Henry II's knights blew his head and murdered him while he was praying. Let's see what are the miracle powers he had and how he was murdered. 
The murder of Thomas Beckett in 1170 and the manner of his death shocked the nation. After Beckett took a blow to the head from King Second, King Henry II's knights while praying in Canterbury Cathedral on 29th December 1170, Arnold the goldsmith and a few monks scooped his brains into a basin. Beckett's body was then carried to the crypt where the doors were bolted and barred until three months later in April 1171 when the crypt was opened to the public. Actually, King Henry II's intention was not to kill Thomas Beckett. When the four knights placed a long knife on the shoulder of Thomas Beckett while he was praying, he stood sternly so they killed him, they murdered him. And after that, Brother William and Prayer Benedict, two monks from Canterbury, were appointed to keep a book which documented the miracles that took place while the visitors were at Thomas Beckett's tomb. There were 703 miracles recorded by William and Benedict, which ranged from the cure of leprosy, blindness, paralysis to that of epilepsy. So likewise, he was the miraculous man and he has the magical power to cure the people. So it spread all over the world and also shocked the whole world. And after that, people started to visit the uh, St. Thomas Beckett's tomb. So after that, the news of Thomas Beckett's miracles spread like wildfire. As a contemporary wrote, the miracles first took place about his tomb. Then through the whole crypt, then the whole church, then all of the Canterbury, then England, the France, Normandy, Germany, and the whole world. Unfortunately, this shrine was totally destroyed during the Reformation in 1540. When King Henry VIII ordered his bones to be destroyed and all mention of his names obliterated. Today, the place of Thomas' death in Canterbury Cathedral is marked by a simple stone bearing his name but he was considered to be a martyr. On this incident, there was a book written on uh, St. Thomas Beckett, that is the murder in the cathedral written by T.S. Eliot. You can go through that work. In the beginning, Chaucer says how he joined with other pilgrims. A company setting out for the pilgrimage gathers in Tabard Inn. Chaucer makes their acquaintance and forms one of the party. The pilgrims are 32, including Chaucer and the host of the Tabat Inn. The prologue suggests that the poet reached the Tabat Inn in one spring evening. Southwark is the place for arrival and departure for all the pilgrims. Chaucer himself and the innkeeper, the host, also join the company. At supper, the host of the Tabat Inn proposes that on their journey on horses, each of them would tell two tales from this side and two more on their return journey and thus relieve themselves of the tediousness or tiredness of the journey. All the pilgrims were agreed and they would submit to the judgment of the host as to which of them tells the best story and the best storyteller among them was to be given a supper at the general expense. This decision having been accepted by all, they agreed to set out on their journey early next morning. Lots are drawn to decide who shall tell the first tale. The lot falls to the knight, so like the knight starts to tell his tale. But the company of the pilgrims never reaches Canterbury and only 23 of the pilgrims get their turn to tell their tales. Some tales were left incomplete. Others are manifestly unadapted to the tellers. However, the tales present before us a cross-section of contemporary social life. The purpose in writing the prologue was Chaucer's desire to represent 14th century social life realistically and graphically. Each pilgrim is representative of his class Thus, all the broad social classes bearing the lowest and the highest are colorfully gathered together in the prologue. Chaucer was the first poet to create living human characters in English literature. His characters are as real today as they were in Chaucer's day. The Canterbury Tales, the general prologue text, 
hi here i have given the modern text because the chazidian language will be very much difficult to understand and now here i give just the paraphrase only in the prologue uh, uh, chaucer has uh, presented every character how they appear their mannerism and their way of dressing their language uh, using of language everything he has given there before that in which season they are uh, starting their pilgrimage that is beautifully described in the beginning from these lines chaucer beautifully describes the spring season so the april month is the best and proper season to start their pilgrimage so that's why chaucer says that it is the april month the drought of march would have made all the roots of plants and trees dried but the april month's rain makes all the roots of plants and trees wet and also gives blossoms and also this is the time the west wind also with its sweet breath puts new life into the tender shoots in every grove and field and the young sun has run half its course in the ram so ram in the sense here it is the first zodiac sign aries so during the chaucer's time uh, the sun entered the sign aries on april 5 and left it on may 6 so this is the time the sun begins its journey the spring equinox so that is why the sun is called as the young sun and during this time the small birds that sleep all night with open eyes sing melodiously so nature pricks them and their heart swells with joy then people long to go on pilgrimages and the farmers pilgrims holding palm branches in their hands they were called as farmers they will long to seek strange shores of far off saints renowned in various countries and especially from every country in england down to canterbury they go to seek the holy blissful martyr saint thomas who always helped them when they were sick and we have seen already about saint thomas he has cured so many people from their sickness so people go to the pilgrimage because they believe that uh, he will protect them from all kind of illness so this chaucer describes beautifully about the spring season he says in that day as i i in the sense here it describes about the poet the poet stayed at the tabard in southwark he was ready to go on a pilgrimage to the canterbury with the most devout heart there arrived at night into the tavern some 29 people belonging to different walks of life they happened to come together by chance and they were all pilgrims intending to ride to the canterbury the rooms in the tavern and the stables stables for the horses were quite spacious so they were all easily and comfortably accommodated soon when the sun had gone to rest the poet spoke to them all about the trip and soon he was admitted to their company he made a promise to rise early and to proceed on their journey to the place and chaucer describes it to us here we must remember one thing that it is in the first person narration of the whole poem but nevertheless uh, while the poet has time and a space before proceeding the further story of him It seems quite reasonable that he should tell us all about their condition the full array of each of them as it appeared to him according to their profession and social position and also how they were dressed he will first therefore begin with a knight knight is the first to tell his story in this prologue chaucer describes how the knight was the knight was a most distinguished man from the time he first began to ride abroad he had followed the ideals of chivalry chivalry in the sense courtesy towards women truth honor freedom and courtesy he distinguished himself in his lord's war and moreover he had ridden into battles more often than any other man in christendom as well as in heathen countries it means he tells that he has fought in many wars and he was ever honored for his noble graces he was at alexandria when it was captured often at feasts he sat at the head of the table above men of all nations in prussia he fought in lithuania and russia 
no christian of his position had so often done so he had been at the siege of algiers which is situated in granada and on an expedition to benamarin which is situated in africa he was also at ayas ayas is in armenia and at atalia he had been there when they were captured so likewise he had been out on a many a naval expedition in the mediterranean he had been in 15 deadly battles and fought for our faith faith in the sense here christianity thrice in tournaments at tramisin and he always slew his enemy this same distinguished knight had also once upon a time been with the lord of palatia against another heathen in turkey and always he had won great renown and praise though he was so much distinguished so wise yet was as modest in his bearing as a maiden he was never at guilty of coarseness or brusqueness even in speech towards any person he was thus a very true and perfect gentle knight now the chaucer tells about the appearance of the knight the knight had a fine horse but he was not splendidly dressed he wore a doublet of fustian it means coarse cloth stained and dark with the smudges where his armor had left marks just home from service he had come to do his pilgrimage it means it seems that he has come straight away from the battle now chaucer describes the second pilgrim a youthful young squire the young squire is a lover and merry bachelor with curly locks as if they had been laid in press chaucer guesses he was 20 years of age in stature he was of a moderate height and he had a remarkable agility and great strength he had been at one time out with the cavalry in flanders in atios and picardy and he conducted himself valiantly in so short a time hoping to win his lady's favor he wore a garment so embroidered that it appeared to be a meadow full of fresh flowers white and red this is important he was all the day singing or fluting he was as fresh as is the month of may his gown was short with long and wide sleeves he could sit gracefully on the horse and ride well he could compose songs and recite them fight in a tournament and also dance and paint and write very well he loved his lady so fervently that he slept no more at night than does a nighting girl he was however courteous humble and serviceable and carved to serve his father at the table the third pilgrim is the yeoman and yeoman is the servant for the night and there was no other servants at that time for he chose to write so the yeoman wore a green coat and hood he carried carefully under his belt a neatly sheathed sheaf of bright and keen peacock arrows like a true yeoman he could dress his gear elegantly his arrows with drooping feathers did not fly slantingly in his hand he carried a mighty bow his head was closely shaved his face was brown he knew the whole of woodcraft upon his arms he bore a bright brace on one side of which hung a shield and a sword on the other side there was a fine looking dagger with a decorated hilt and sharp as the point of the spear on his breast he wore a medal having the figure of saint christopher made of bright silver he also carried a hunting horn and belt he wore was green as per the guessing of chaucer the yeoman seemed completely a forester or a hunter our fourth pilgrim is the nun this is also an important character in this prologue the nun was also called as a prioress or the head of her convent her way of smiling was very simple and shy her greatest oath was by saint loy she was known as madam eglantine she sang the divine service sweetly with a fine nasal intonation she spoke french fairly and neatly following the manner of the school of stratford atty bowie 
because the french of paris was unknown to her she was moreover very well trained in table manners she allowed no morsel morsel in the sense a drop of food to fall from her lips she did not dip her fingers too deep in the sauce she could well carry a morsel up and keep it up so that even a drop did not fall upon her breast she took special pleasure in courtesy she wiped her upper lip so cleanly that not a trace of grease was to be seen upon the napkin when she finished her drink drink here is the wine she reached for her meat quite gracefully and certainly she was mirthful pleasant and amiable in her behavior it means she is friendly in her behavior she took pains to imitate a courtly kind of grace a stately bearing befitting her place and to appear dignified in all her dealings as for her sympathies and tender feelings she was so charitable and compassionate that she would weep if she saw even a mouse caught in a trap thinking it to be dead or bleeding she had a few small dogs whom she fed with roasted flesh or milk or fine white bread she wept bitterly if one of them were dead or when anybody hit one of them with a stick sharply she was indeed sentimental and tender hearted so these are all the characters of the prioress or nun and now chaucer describes about the dressing sense of uh, prioress her head dress was gracefully pleated her nose was slender and sharp her eyes were gray as glass her mouth was very small but soft and red but certainly she had a fair forehead almost as broad as a span she was indeed by no means undergrown her cloak was elegant she wore a coral trinket on her arm a set of beads the gaudies it means larger beads ticked in green and upon it hung a golden brooch of brightest shining on which there was engraved a crown a and then the latin phrase amor vindict omnia it means love conquers all during that time wearing the brooches were the fashion so so far we have seen the four pilgrims their characters and their way of dressing in this prologue and let us continue the remaining in our next chapter so if you want to know all the literature oriented topics please kindly like comment share and subscribe this channel amor vindictomnia